Hello and welcome to the video. You're looking at a very familiar sight, I'm sure. That is the Ben Jonson a poem to the reader on the left and the Martin Droeshout engraving on the right, which appear on the title page of Shakespeare's first folio of 1623, both of which inform us that William Shakespeare was a pseudonym being used by Edward de Vere, Earl of Oxford. If you don't know how, you will find explanations to this on my channel. One of them is called Ben Jonson New. We've also looked at this poem just over the page, uh, written by Ben Jonson, again, to the memory of my beloved, the author, and on a presentation which is on this channel called Sweet Swan of Avon, I go through several chunks of this showing, once again, how Ben Jonson is alluding to the fact that Shakespeare is a pseudonym of the Earl of Oxford. What I would like to do today, if I may, is look with some scrutiny at the last six lines. It is nearly always at the very end of a poem of the Elizabethan or Jacobean era that the poet hides his biggest message, his nub, his rub, his kick, his salt, whatever you wish to call it, and it's just by peeling off the obvious surface meaning that you can see what that message is. And the message here is extremely interesting and extremely pertinent to the Shakespearean authorship question, so that's what we're going to look at today. First of all, then, the surface meaning, uh, easy to understand, I think, but stay, I see thee in the hemisphere, advanced and made a constellation there, shine forth, thou star of poets, and with rage or infamy influence, chide or cheer the drooping stage, which since thy flight from hence hath mourned like night, and despairs day, but for thy volume's light. So pretty obvious what he's saying, if it weren't for the great light, the illumination of your plays, your book of plays, uh, the stage today, the theatre would be absolutely nowhere, it'd be in a second-rate state, and you are the star of poets shining down with your wonderful influence on the modern stage. So I don't think anyone would argue with that, basically, as the the synopsis of those six nines. But as I say, we're going to look much deeper and we're going to find something very interesting. Just by way of context, I'm going to go back to the four lines before the bit we're interested in. Sweet Swan of Avon, what a sight it were to see thee in our waters yet appear, and make those flights upon the banks of Thames that so did take Eliza and our James. He is talking about Queen Elizabeth and King James, who enormously enjoyed the Shakespeare plays on the banks of the Thames. Where? Well, enjoyed them at Avon. Avon was an old-fashioned name for Hampton Court, a poetical name. And I go into this in some detail in the presentation on this channel called Sweet Swan of Avon. So do have a look at that if you haven't seen it already. This time, I don't want to talk much about Avon, but about the word swan. It's quite normal uh, in those days for poets to be alluded to as swans. The habit goes all the way back to Pindar and Virgil. But there may be a special reason here why Johnson pulls up the name swan to talk of Shakespeare. He may be thinking of the Knight of the Swan, that medieval legend that tells of the knight who entered drawn by a swan on a boat, uh, who would never give his name, and he did good deeds, he saved a damsel, uh, but nothing could be done if his identity were known. So it was absolutely crucial to him that his name was hidden. And this, I think, ties in to Edward de Vere, who, of course, in his day was a concealed poet who wrote his greatest works, his plays, and put them out under the pseudonym of William Shakespeare, as one of his contemporaries, John Boddenham wrote in 1600, uh, Edward de Vere publishes his works under other people's names. Now, in 1804, Walter Scott wrote, a peer of England, the Earl of Oxford, if we recollect aright, conceited himself to be descended of the doughty knight of the swan. Well, it's extraordinary this, and I don't know what Walter Scott's source was, I would love to find out, but tantalising, as you can see, the connection there between the Earl of Oxford, who hid his name, who did not want his name to be known, um, or his good deeds, his works, to be known by his own name, and the knight of the swan, who, in precisely the same way, did not want his good deeds um, to be associated with his real name. But moving back to Ben Jonson and to this extraordinary poem that he's written, um, but stay, I see thee in the hemisphere advanced and made a constellation there shine forth, thou star of poets. 
Those of you who saw the presentation Sweet Swan of Avon will probably remember that I associated the Star of Poets with the sole charge on the arms of Edward de Vere, the Earl of Oxford, which is a five-pointed silver star or mullet. I think Ben Jonson would have been absolutely delighted by that connection and certainly would have known that Edward de Vere's arms uh, had a single charge being a, a star. However, as I said, we are going to look at a profounder meaning that lies behind these words. How to open it up like an oyster? Well, you need the right knife, you need to find the place to insert it and just wriggle it a bit. And that's what I did reading these lines, advanced and made a constellation there, shine forth thou star of poets, made me realise that there was an obvious problem. Why does Ben Jonson call Shakespeare a constellation, which after all is a group of stars in a specific pattern, and in the very next line calls him a star? You can't be both a star and a constellation. Well, I've never accepted the Stratfordian way of playing these things out, which is to say, oh, he just made a mistake, he just wasn't concentrating, he was um, thinking of something different when he wrote these lines. That is not how Ben Jonson operated. He was an extremely clever man with an extraordinarily bright mind, and what he did, he did very deliberately and on purpose. And I am absolutely certain that he wrote constellation and star right next to each other, both describing the same person, because he wanted us to think about that and to work it out and to find his deeper meaning. Well, the constellation is very easy to identify. Don't forget that Shakespeare is being addressed as a swan, and there's only one swan uh, that advanced in the hemisphere and was made a constellation there and that swan was Cygnus. Cygnus the constellation in the sky which for thousands of years um, people have looked up at this pattern and decided it looked like a swan. It goes back to Greek legend probably even before that of the young man who was turned by the gods into a swan and then ultimately because they liked him turned him into a constellation up in the sky. So we can't doubt that it is very easy to identify the constellation which Johnson is talking about and that constellation has to be Cygnus. Well, if the constellation is so easy to identify, what about the star? Is it likely that Johnson gives us um, a specific constellation and then just wanders into a general star. I don't think it is. Well, at least I think it would be sensible to attempt to identify the star if it is possible to do so. And obviously that's not very easy. As Shakespeare said, the skies are painted with unnumbered sparks. They are all fire and every one doth shine. Yes, they are unnumbered sparks, but can we amongst those unnumbered sparks identify the singular star that Johnson is referring to here just by looking at clues in the last four lines. Astonishingly, the answer is yes, we can identify exactly which star he is talking about. So I'm going to set up the clues that Johnson leaves for us and I'll show you how we do that. He talks of this star as able to rage or influence, chide or cheer the drooping stage. So let's put the first clue up then. This star can criticise and influence the world. Oh, I hear you say you've changed the word stage to world, but of course it's a, it's a metaphor. As we know, Shakespeare himself says, all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances. That's from As You Like It. Well, I'm sorry to tell you that Shakespeare wasn't being entirely original. This goes back um, forever, thousands of years. Here's a 1571 uh, text which says, Pythagoras said that this world was like a stage whereon many play their parts. So in other words, since the time of Pythagoras, people have been using the stage as a metaphor for the world. And actually, this is a particularly apt one, of course, because Ben Jonson is talking about a playwright. So it's very useful to be able to say the stage, meaning the stage, but also use it as a metaphor for the world. OK, so that's our first clue, that this star uh, could criticise and influence the world. Do we have another clue? 
but for thy volume's light, i.e., um, were it not for the for the light of this star, remember that you can you you read stars and you can read a volume. So we're in the world of metaphor again. We're talking about the star. We're addressing the star. So were it not for this star's light, the drooping world hath mourned like night and despairs day. So what does that tell us about this star? Something very interesting indeed that its light uh, is visible both by night and by day another very useful clue to try and identify the star with another clue um, we s it came in the sky since thy flight from hence since thy flight from hence means since the death of Shakespeare so that this star first appeared in the night sky after Shakespeare's death or night and day since it seems to be visible by both I think there's another little clue here as well. We, we talked about the juxtaposition of constellation and star, and this tells me that in Ben Jonson's mind, at least, there is some connection between this star and Cygnus. So from those four clues, are we able to tell which star uh, ben Jonson is referring to. Well, actually, we can more or less tell from just one of them. That's the third one. It first appeared after Shakespeare's death. Well, if you're a Stratfordian, that's someone who believes that uh, the, the plays and poems of William Shakespeare were written by a man called Will Shakespeare of Stratford-upon-Avon, then you say to yourself, well, he died in 1616, so that's easy. All we have to do is find a star that appeared in the sky after the death of Will Shakespeare of Stratford in 1616 and in time for Ben Jonson to be able to comment upon it in 1623. Whoops, there is no such star. In fact, there's no star appears in the night sky until 1888, none in the Milky Way visible to the naked eye. Uh, until 1987. So poor old Stratfordians once again find themselves in a big problem here and probably abandon the whole idea. Uh, but if you're not a Stratfordian, you keep being interested with this and you go backwards from 1616 and say, did a star appear in the night sky uh, before 1616? And the answer is yes, one did. Here is a strange photograph of what is actually the remnants of it. It was called SN1604, that's Supernova 1604. Now, that might make some of your eyes or ears prick up, because 1604, of course, was the year in which Edward de Vere, the Earl of Oxford, died. He was buried in July 1604, and three months later, in October, this star appeared in the night sky. And you, I can tell you it had an enormous uh, influence. It was the subject of lectures by Galileo, and Kepler published this large book on it, very famous book, um, called De Stella Nova in uh, Pede Serpentari. That means concerning the new star in the foot of Serpentaria, Serpentaria being the constellation where it was seen. And Kepler was astonished by this star. He was actually looking at the night sky in order to um, study the conjunction of Mars and Jupiter. And Kepler, in this book, says that the, the Stella Nova, the new star, did not appear by accident, but by God's purpose, using the rules of astrology in order to exhort humans who are dependent on him and to inform them of his opinions. That was Kepler's view of why that star um, arrived there. In the book, you can see this wonderful drawing, this map of Serpentaria, known also as the Fiacus, the, the serpent bearer. And there in his foot, you can see the star marked N, meaning Nova. It's the new star. And it's you can see it's very large and very bright. That's not just because he's trying to illustrate where it was, but it was indeed a very bright star, visible to the naked eye, and Kepler's star, sometimes known as Kepler's supernova. It was brighter at its peak than any other star in the night sky, and was visible both in the night and during the day for over three weeks. It was spotted all around the world. There are records of people spotting it in China, in Korea, and in Arabia. And of course, it became a very major talking point amongst men of learning and culture. Actually, Ben Jonson mentions it in his play Volpone, describing it as the new star full of omen. 
of course, uh, William Shakespeare in his plays, who's constantly showing interest in astronomical events. He does not mention this because, as we've just said, he died uh, before it appeared. But of course, the Stratfordianist is, is in a muddle about that, and they think he didn't die until 1616. They just have to explain why he didn't bother to make any mention of this, this very, very major event. Um, OK, so going back to the various clues about this star, it would criticise and influence the world. Yes, we've got that. Um, it was visible both by night and day. Yes, it certainly was. It first appeared after Shakespeare's death. Yes, or at least to those who understand that Shakespeare died in 1604. Then, of course, the supernova 1604 arrived just three months after that. What then of the connection in Johnson's mind between this star, the supernova 1604, and the constellation of Cygnus? As we have seen, uh, the supernova was in the constellation of Ophiuchus, the serpent bearer, not Cygnus. Interesting enough, just uh, four years earlier, in 1600, there was a, a new star, much less important one, a smaller one called P. Cygni. You can see it marked there um, with a P. That was found for the first time in the constellation of Cygnus. And these two stars, the, the, the P. Cygni of 1600 and the much brighter and more important uh, Stella Nova of 1604, combined to give the idea, certainly to European thinkers, that God uh, was opening a door on a reformation of thought, a reformation of politics. A new world was opening up because of these two new stars that had appeared. And John Donne in 1610 wrote of them, but as when the heaven looks on us with new eyes, those stars every artist exercise. I don't know if he knew, he probably didn't at that stage, that Rubens and Velasquez were among artists who had already alluded to the importance of these new stars. And here, of course, in Kepler's book, the one we just looked at, the, the, the Stella Nova, the new star uh, in Serpentaria, it also has a chapter, um, De Stella Incognita Signi, uh, upon the unknown star of Cygnus. So they were very much joined together in people's minds, the, the Cygnus star of 1600 and the Stella Nova of 1604. I'm showing you here a very mystical representation of the mind, which is shown as a castle with wings and wheels. And this is all to do with the Rosicrucians, published in 1618. You can see at the bottom there, the rose and the cross, in Greek, rhodos and stauros. And the Rosicrucians were a secret society, a Christian society, concerned with knowledge of God's creation and the relation between the mind of man and the mind of God. If you look up in the left there, I've ringed Serpentaria, the serpent barrier, and there you can see the date, 1604. So important, that date. That is the date when the star appeared, and you can see it just behind him, shedding light now on the castle of the mind. And just over to the right, you see Cygnus, um, with the star behind it also shedding light down onto this uh, winged and wheeled castle. Uh, both of them have next to them the word vidi amini, may you be seen. So very much a connection uh, between the Stella Nova of 1604 and Cygnus. Why do I bring this up? Well, because uh, Ben Jonson, in the year after he had written that wonderful poem to Shakespeare in uh, 1623, he published The Fortunate Isles, which is a mask 1624, in which we hear this, Know ye not Utis? Utis, by the way, means nobody in Greek. Know ye not Utis? Then know nobody, the good old hermit that was said to dwell here in the forest without trees, that built the castle in the air where all the brethren rhodostorotic live. It flies with wings and runs on wheels, where Julian de Campis holds out the brandished blade. Well, here you can see the brandished blade, and if you just look, squint your eyes, the little words underneath it, Jul de Campi, Julius de Campi. So it's absolutely obvious that Ben Jonson 
owned this book, which was published in 1618, and that he knew this engraving very well indeed, because he had clearly stared at it as he describes it perfectly, and therefore he was certainly aware of the connection between the Stella Nova of 1604 and the constellation of Cygnus. So that takes us back to the last of these clues. Uh, yes, in Johnson's mind, it is connected with Cygnus, this particular star. So this gives, I hope, a clear understanding now of Johnson's intention in the last six lines of his remarkable poem to Shakespeare. On the one hand, he is indicating to the learned readers that Shakespeare died shortly before the arrival in the skies of Kepler's supernova in October 1604. But more than that, he is suggesting that the death of Shakespeare was followed by the ascension of his mind and virtue, or as Johnson himself put it, his mind and manners, uh, the ascension up into the embodiment of these all-important stars that signalled to learned people all around the world a reformation, a new period, a new age uh, of enlightenment in which people would gain in learning, in understanding, in political and religious um, senses. So it's a huge compliment to Shakespeare, uh, and as we know, he's talking really about Edward de Vere. And the question arises, what gave him, what gave Johnson this idea that a writer's task in life is to uh, lend his mind, his manners and his virtue to the heavens posthumously in order to influence mankind going forward? I may have an answer to that, and I'll take you there via a slightly wriggly route. You may remember in Sweet Swan of Avon, that presentation, I pointed out that this title that Johnson puts to this poem is precisely 17 words long. And there's a reason for that. It's an old trick. Um, he is trying to align his dedication to the 17th Earl of Oxford. I say it's an old trick. I'll take you back to um, 1573 to this book and you'll see this dedication to the right honourable and my good lord, the Earl of Oxford, Lord Great Chamberlain of England. I don't think it's an accident that that, again, is exactly 17 words, nor if you go to the title page of the book do I think it's an accident, Cardana's Comfort, translated into English and published by commandment of the Right Honourable the Earl of Oxford, is also 17 words, and that the 17th word is Oxenford, because he is the 17th Earl of Oxford. So this little game was being played um, quite a long time ago, and I'm pretty sure that Ben Jonson, who is an extremely learned person and read many, many, many books, would have come across this book. It went into several editions. There was another one in uh, 1576. What it is, is a translation of an Italian philosopher called Jerome Cardano, and it is a book of comfort, what you might now call a, a self-help book, telling people how to deal with uh, bereavement and death and such things like that. It is often referred to as Hamlet's book, but I don't want to go into that now. It is certainly the Earl of Oxford's book. As you can see, it was published by commandment of him. It is a translation by a friend of Oxford's called Thomas Beddingfield. And in 1571, that's two years before this was published, Beddingfield sent some of his translation to Oxford. He was immensely impressed, but Beddingfield was too shy and didn't want to have it published, and that's why Oxford came back to him and said, no, you have to publish it, and that's why it's by commandment. And in this book, there's a poem by Oxford and a letter that he wrote in 1571 to Beddingfield, persuading him to publish this. And in the last six lines, is that a coincidence? In the last six lines of this letter, he writes, this is Oxford, writes to Beddingfield, explaining why he must go on with his work, um, wishing you, as you have begun, to proceed in these virtuous actions. For when all things shall else forsake us, virtue yet will ever abide with us. And when our bodies fall into the bowels of the earth, Yet that, i.e. our virtue, shall mount with our minds into the highest heavens. By your loving and assured friend, Edward Oxenford. So I would suggest that in 
Johnson's last lines, there is also a little allusion to this idea that a writer ends in the highest heavens influencing mankind from above after his death. So I hope as much of that as possible was plain to you and understandable. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope also that if you did enjoy it, you will subscribe and press the bell button so that future presentations will be alerted to you. Thank you very much for watching.